were after that, I think it's time to, to sit down and sort of spoil the meeting, really. I mean, it's fantastic. I, I do think when you listen and hear Morella speak, it gets the sense of um, injustice, of anger, of passion, of determination, which is not, of course, just in Spain, but exists right across the, uh, right across the globe. When you look at the revolutions taking place in the, in the Arab world, uh, the mass movements in this country, in, uh, in Spain, in Greece and so on, you do see the, the youth, the young people, at the centre and the heart of that. And what I want to really speak about today is why, why is that the case? And I'll say something about that in, in, in a moment. And I really, I don't really need to elaborate on a lot of the things I was going to say has already been said, so I can cut my talk down hopefully uh, even longer and have more discussion. But I do think it's quite interesting though, isn't it? Because up until, I, I remember when 52,000 of us marched in November last year, and we marched uh, through London, and our students then went and trashed the headquarters of the Tory Party headquarters. Brilliant day! You give yourself a clap. Brilliant. Brilliant. But you know, I, 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 I was talking at work, and people, you know, some people, I said, I was, was I shocked? Well, not really. I'm, well, they're angry. You know, I'm not that shocked that young people are angry. But who people who were utterly shocked? completely shocked their fantasies was the ruling class, was the Tories, because they believe their own bullshit. They believe, they believe that you lot, I mean a lot of you lot, I'm, I'm a little bit older than most of you, but of course, right? But the most people I look in this room, what they believe is this, number one, you're all bunch of uh, self-interested, uh, indulgent, apolitical people who really, all you care about are your iPods, your looks, um, it's all very beautiful people, of course, but you know, <laughs> what you're interested in, and uh, not interested in politics at all. And they, I mean, they keep telling this time and time and time and time again, and they actually not believe in their own bullshit. So if you have that in your head, this is what you think young people are. They're not interested in politics at all, and actually also they're a bunch of hoodlums. They go around beating up, mugging, killing, knifing, and all these other things they, 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 they do. So when, literally, not only did they take the street in the tens of thousands, but when they ended up smashing up, to smithereens in such a heroic way, in such a determined way, with um, clearly in a political way. And I remember the media afterwards talking about, well, these students trying to say they're self-interested. They all want to about their fees. But they clearly had, I'm fighting not just for me, but my younger, uh, my younger uh, brother or my younger sister, so they can go to university. And all of a sudden, they saw a bunch of young people who weren't self-interested, self-indulgent, simply worried about their iPods, their whatever, their looks and God knows what else. They're a generation who are egalitarian. They worry about others. They worry about equality. Where did this come from? They wonder. Now, theology, is it really surprising? I mean, this is a, you are a generation of people who have been shaped by continuous war, almost 10 years now. You've been shaped by environment, and you're a generation who alerted us to the problems and the worries and the fears and the real dangers of environmental catastrophe. And you're a generation who materially are going to be worse off than your generation of parents before you. That is what has shaped uh, a generation of people. Now, you know, underneath the surface, there's all sorts of alienation, God knows what else, but sooner or later, that breaks through. That's what you saw at Milbank on the 10th of November, and then the consequent demonstrations or revolts which followed that, and, and of course, across the globe afterwards. And therefore, the similarities, it seems, between Spain, between in Egypt, are, and here, are, 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 are very, 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 very clear. Um, of course, revolu any revolutions, instant when they happen, be it 1848, <coughs> be they uh, 16, 1960 to 1975, be it, of course, 1917 to 1923, all revolutions are moments in history which key, to be, key things happen, connect them, but also they're not just moments. They are, they are, it's a process which takes place, a period of development which takes place. And also they're at different speeds as well. Because when I say, when I listen to what one watched, I unfold the revolution in Egypt, and I saw young people on TV talking about their, what, what motivated them to go on the streets, what motivated them to take on the, the, the police and the armed forces and so on, they could have been in a, any street corner or any place in, a, in, 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 in this country. But it doesn't mean to say exactly the same. Clearly, if you like, the, the, we might be in the, we're not, we're not, we're in the same book, not the same chapter. Yes, the level of struggle is high at certain places, goes at low, different speeds and so on. But what connects them together is a fight, the impact of neoliberalism and the response to neoliberalism and the consequences that they try to do so. So in that sense, we should see ourselves as we clearly hear today. We are part of an international struggle. And that's not just a nice thing to say, or is a nice thing to say, but it's much more important than that. Being part of an international struggle, because this struggle cannot simply be won in one country. 
can start in one country, of course. I mean, we'll have victories like in, in Egypt, get rid of Barak, gives confidence in other countries to, to follow suit. But in the end of the day, we are about the international, international struggle for democracy, for socialism across the board. So it's not a nicety, it's a necessity when we understand the question of solidarity. So we have speakers from Egypt, from Spain, not just learning the lessons, but also drawing them out and pulling them together so we can actually go forward. Chris Harmon, one of the uh, leading theoreticians, um, when his life made a very interesting uh, quote, I thought, when he talked about revolutions and uh, understanding revolutions, how they are a product of different contradictions. He says this, Revolutions and mass movements are products of contradictions which have been developing the years that came, bef came before and which continue to explode in the decades afterwards. I think this is very, very important because going back to the point, when, it, it, when in the, the Millbank events occurred and people were shocked, of course the ruling class explained why, but the left shouldn't be shocked, but some were. And it happened in 1968, in 1968, uh, Again, it was Tony Cliff who described how, for much the left in 1968, when the big general strikes, the riots, for many it was like a, a lightning bolt going through a clear blue sky. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody saw it coming to the end. Again, Chris Harmon, his brilliant book about that period, talks about how you can read a million words in the bourgeois press before 1968 and you wouldn't have got an inkling of that, that those moments taking place. But for revolutionaries, people like us in this room, it's important, we can't never predict. Nobody knew the Mill Bank, nobody knew that to hear square, nobody knew it could be, that'd be a bloody be easy, wouldn't it? Forget, we need, you know, don't need theory just to have a bit of a crystal ball, that's all you'd need. But clearly, it is having an understanding what took place before, understanding what the, what the pressures are on in society, those contradictions which are building up in the surface are very important for us to understand because you, know, you might know the key moments but you won't be taken so surprised by them and thus you can start to shape them, keep ahead of the movement, try and give it some direction, some, some focus, some, some, some kind of leadership. So again, understanding the past, understanding the process, understanding what took place which gave birth to key moments of revolutions are as important in many ways as the moment itself and understanding it and giving it, giving it a lead. Second point I want to say is this. About, young, about, about youth and revolution. Um, it's not just about youth. I think there is this sort of um, salicized version of history, isn't there? You know, 1968 was really, nowadays, you listen about it, basically it's Woodstock, drugs, sex, rock and roll, all these kinds of things, and that's what hippies, and that's really what young people get a bit pissed with, the way they lived, and you know, the old fashioned way of running things, and so on and so forth. And that was an element of truth to all these things, but it completely really sanitizes what took place in terms of revolution. And they always do this, you know, trying to sort of make sure, I mean, you can see it happening today with the Egyptian revolution. It is absolutely true that the youth, in, the young people, the 16 to 25 year olds, university students, and so on, the unemployed, young unemployed, were very, very central to sparking, igniting those kinds of, uh, kinds of struggles. But of course, what eventually brought Mubarak down was when the organised working class moved onto the centre stage. You know, when the demands moved from the question of democratic demands to that of the question of wages, the question of nationalisation, and so on and so forth. And it's those things which are always part, part of any serious revolution. So, you know, I, I say this because I think it's important. You, you get it a lot, lot nowadays when you hear some, again, from the left talk about, oh, it's the youth, it's the, the dispossessed, it's, it's not the organised working class. Well, not true, is it? I mean, at the moment, you look at the revolutions that take place, some less, some more, of course, but they're very much uh, part of uh, that uh, revolution it, uh, it, itself. So I think it's important that we don't simply betray it as something, a youth revolution, but something which young people are actually central, central to, as they always have been in any revolution, um, but very much linked to a wider struggle of working class people, of the organised working class people, in the, in the struggle to defend, uh, defend, to defend their lives. I mean, I, I mentioned... Um, what took place in terms of uh, in terms of attitude towards how how young people's lives have changed. I mean, Paul Foot, um, when he was alive, used to make uh, his speeches. He used to make the point I've already made. I'll quickly make it again. He used to turn around and say that, and it always just struck me, struck me very strongly. He said that the, you're the first generation of young people since the Second World War who will be poorer than their parents will be. Now I always think that that's absolutely quite astounding, quite astounding. That capitalism it must be so advanced has actually gone backwards. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I told this. I mean, my teacher, GCSE English, and I was taking my FE class, and I was, t I, was, I don't know why I was talking about this to GCSE English, but I mean, that's usually the case with all my students. I was like, why are we doing this for? But anyway, that's a side point. Um, that, um, 
So they asked me a question, and, and, and I went through it, and they all looked stunned. I doesn't look like they're completely depressed at 9 o'clock in the morning, talking about these poor in their beds. And after we did this, uh, they said, why, why does this happen? What took, what, why took place? So I had to try and explain. I went through well, about the redistribution of wealth and how the, uh, there's a thing called the trickle-down effect. The trickle-down effect is something in which where you, you tax the, the very, the, you, you cut the tax of the very rich, they have more money in their pockets, and it all trickles down to the rest of us to spend on the National Health Service and so on and so forth. And I looked around, I thought it was explanation, the students looked really, looked really strange. And then after a few moments, the kid stuck his hand up. I said, yes. And he said, yes, sir. And you fell for that. Now, <laughs> 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 of course, I, not me, I have four days <laughs> 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 But, you know, there's an instant absurdity to the thing, isn't it? When you explain it in such a way, there's an absurdity to the situation where, increasingly, there is a clash between how people visualise the world and they, they, they see it now and they understand the world and the lunacy and the, of the explanations we're given to understand why we're all poor. Oh yes, makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense. And that, that clash between so-called so common sense or their ideas and the reality and the experience of already working people's lives, and particularly young people's lives, is something which is clashing and thus is, is the motivation for people to take the streets and do what they do in Milbank. And I think that has to be the, the, the starting point of, of understanding this. And therefore the system itself, going back to a, more, a bigger point, as Marx said, is when the, the, the social relations by classes in society become a fetter, a straitjacket, on the further development of the forces of production, like jobs and industry. It is I, that's because when society is based on the accumulation, accumulation of wealth, where competition is built into the system, a minority ends up benefiting, benefiting from the competitive process. What determines uh, what, what gets reduced and what doesn't is not human need, but the need to maintain a competitive advantage over, the, over other firms and nations. So spending billions on weapons of mass destruction to ensure that you keep your competitive edge seems perfectly sensible, despite millions of children dying of lack of water and food every, every year. So the system is going backwards. So in every way you can look at this, there's a contradiction at the heart of it. The system itself cannot deliver anymore. As class society has grown up and all the <coughs> forces of production around it, that in itself comes a block for the further development of humanity and society and therefore treating our young people with decency and respect and uh, allowing them to have their own creative spaces, develop their own, uh, own, own, own ideas. And I think that is a starting point for when we understand what is taking place and how the young people are the centre of it. Is it. I mean, clearly, as was mentioned already, the, the question of mass unemployment, as an example, is really quite a central issue here, I think. Um, here's a quote from the... Um, which is from, make sure that it's right, I think it's The Economist, yes it is, from The Economist. The title is this, Young, Jobless and Looking for Trouble. We, <laughs> uh, a bit concerned at the moment. We are all rightly fixated the politics of what's going on in Egypt at the moment. <coughs> it's worth sparing a thought for the economics, uh, for the economics too. If Russians in 1917 wanted bread, peace and land, and ended up with totalitarianism, gulags and collective arms, Egyptians, <coughs> particularly young Egyptians, want jobs. Egyptian's youth unemployment rate is currently about 25%. That is clearly a depressing number, but even more depressing that it is not only out of line with, with rates across the region and beyond. Lebanon's youth unemployment is 21%. Tunisia's is 30%. And outside the Arab world, Britain is 20%, and Spain, as we heard, is 40%. So Britain is 20%, whereas uh, you know, the, the, the Egypt is 25%. We're not that, same, same book, not the same chapter, but the same book here. Very, very mass unemployment across policymakers would be well advised to think about how we're going to promote job intensive growth, even as they try to calculate the gigantic geopolitical consequences of the Egyptian work plan. That is a ruling class a bit, a bit panicky here, a bit concerned about what is taking place around the impact of mass un 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 unemployment. Of course, the United States youth unemployment is 21%, and Greece is, uh, is at 18%. Across the globe, the International Labour Organization. Um, uh, 19 million, 16 to 25 year olds are employed. This is astounding figure. It's the largest figure since figures began. 19 million, 16, 25 year olds with nothing to do. Be very frightened, if I would say. You know, this is not a stable society, or a, a world where you have so many young people without without jobs, without education, and and and, and so on. And of course, in Britain, as I already mentioned, 1 million, 1 million, 15 to 25 year olds. Uh, unemployed, what's one in five? Amongst black people in Britain, the figure is 50% who are unemployed. 50% of black people in 65 have no job or education. So not only is it a class attack, it's also impact in terms of racism and discrimination 
and, 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 so, and, and so on. The role of maths, I mean, I think it's worth just saying something about what is the role of unemployment and, and the system. In Engels uh, said, English manufacturer must have at all times, say, the brief periods of highest prosperity, an unemployed reserve army of labour. It's called the unemployment reserve army of labour uh, in order to produce the masses of goods by the, by the market in the liveliest, uh, liveliest months. I, basically, unemployment is not just about having a go at those who are unemployed. More importantly, it's about disciplining those in work. That's the importance of unemployment. Unemployed, mass unemployment for the ruling class is a tool. Yes, you have a surplus pool of labour who you can recruit uh, when the markets pick up on cheap labour. But, more importantly, it's about how it disciplines those in work in terms of making sure you're in work. You want more wages? There's a queue out there. Don't mess, don't mess me about. Yeah? You want to up top against your employer? You don't like being, being picked upon? That's fine, you can do. There's a queue out there to fill in your shoes just like that. It's a disciplining effect of mass unemployment. That is the key role of mass unemployment across, uh, across society. And that's why it's something when we talk about struggling against unemployment, the key to doing so is in the workplace. The unemployed can be more atomised. The key, of course, is organised labour at the point of production where the power lies. We must make sure that the issue of youth unemployment, unemployment in general, must be a central part of the struggle for, uh, against austerity and against, uh, against, uh, against, against the system. <coughs> so, we, as Foot says, the system itself cannot deliver full employment. I mean, it's interesting, when you look back to the 1950s, for example, when there was a, a, a capitalism was in boom, the longest boom it ever had since the 19th, end of the Second World War, right through to the late 1960s, you had, mass, you had mass, mass full employment, everything accepted to be jobs. Theories were written by the, the reformists uh, around the time. Talked about Crossland, Anthony Crossland talked about how you'll never see a period of unemployment again. We all will live in a wonderful land. Uh, we, 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 our main problem is working out how we can have leisure time because there'll be such a, a fulfilment of, of, of life. Now, of course, that seems a madness now, but it was accepted by people. I and mean, in fact, when you looked at the majority of people in employment, in the 1950s, the majority of people in employment were the age of 16 and 25. Look at it today, and they are the minority in employment. The minority, we look at all the people employed, the minority of those are the age of 16 and 25. Mass youth unemployment has become institutionalised within inside, within inside the system in the last, in the last 30 years. And of course, what they do is, is create, how do, how do we get to accept this? Well, they start creating an ideology, it's an idea. In, 19, in 1976, the Harold Wilson, the Labour politician, uh, uh, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister he talked about how there were all sorts of uh, he, he, mass unemployment hit first time, it reached up to nearly one, one million, very rate So we had to try and put across a, a, an idea of how do you explain this? We know we are moving into a period where full employment no more, the system cannot deliver it. It's impossible for it to deliver it. So how do we accept it? At that time, people didn't, un oh, unemployed, factory <coughs> shuts, it's not my fault, it's the employer's fault. But then, mass unemployment occurs, big debate, it's called the great education debate took place. It wasn't great, it wasn't much of a debate, but nevertheless, it was called at the time, the great education debate, uh, in which Wilson lays the argument. He says, the problem is, is we're not skilled, our young people are deficient. Notice the word, deficient. They're deficient, they don't have skills. And who's to blame? Well, firstly, they are, of course, you're always individual, you're not to blame, you're so stupid and thick, you've got deficiencies. Then us, teachers, we're to, we have a, he used the word anti-industrial <coughs> bias into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Old 1960s, all that stuff, terrible attitudes towards that anti-industrial bias. And of course parents, family life, they don't discipline their students, they, they affect their kids enough, they don't whack them enough, like they hit them hard enough, this is part of the problem and, and so on. So they change the debate, the discourse, away from, it's not just about society, it's about individuals the problem. Of course, Thatcher and everybody else developed that as, as the period of 1980s followed. So the point I'm trying to make is this, that the key to mass unemployment, the system itself, are central, the mass unemployment has been a central part of um, the, the dynamic for young people to take to the streets. When you talk about revolution in these countries, in Spain and everywhere else, it is about level of expectation. You have a expect people say, well, will revolution occur in countries where it's modern and we have all these nice things, material goods and so on and so forth, unlike Africa where they don't, and you're more likely to fight back. But not necessarily. Not necessarily at all. In fact, in Western countries where it's, you're rich and wealthy countries, you have an expectation of jobs, an expectation of uh, a welfare state, you have an expectation of free education. And when those are ripped back from you, that can create mass uh, convulsions against the system and thus lead to, to revolutionary transform, beginning the revolutionary transformation of, of society. 
And when you go through the other conditions, it's not just mass unemployment, I just want to get this across when I finish the meeting, on the conditions of, of, of the young working class in, in Britain today. Let me just go through a few things. I think they're quite shocking. And we should make sure people know about these shocking things. This is what the system does. Homelessness. Joseph Brown Tree Foundation survey has found 75,000 young people are statutory homeless. 75,000. They're statutory. Since 16, 16 to 19 year olds. That's ones who are on the books. Overcrowding. 500... 526,000, over half a million young people live in overcrowded homes. In London, particularly where it's acute, 37% of all overcrowded homes people live in, in London. Crime and the criminalisation of young people, massive, yeah. particularly under New Labour, and of course will continue. We see it with mass demonstrations. 300 young people arrested on the demonstrations. That's the biggest I've ever known in the 30 years I've been involved in politics. This is the state clamping down on young people to the source of their fear, and want to put the fear of God in people to do the demonstration again. Criminalisation of young people. But also, stop and search, 9%, uh, in increased by 9%. Black people, seven times more likely to be stopped than Asian youth, uh, who are, are twice as likely to compare to white, white youth. New Labour created 700 new offences in its time in office. Um, some 3,350 children and young people are locked up in England and Wales in, uh, uh, and Dublin in a decade. Dublin in a decade under the Labour government and will increase to do, do so. Um, I could go on and on. Mental health. I think mental health yeah, I think it, it, it's very, very uh, obscene to see the level and rate of, 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 of uh, uh, mental health. Self-harming. 115, 11, 25 years self-harm. Um, 142,000 young people uh, admitted to A&E departments. Uh, as a result, uh, result of, of, of self-harm. Suicide rate. Look, young people commit suicide for also many, many different reasons. You look at a graph, from the last 79 to the present period, goes up and up and up, particularly young, among young boys, but young women creeping up as well. So suicide rates, anorexia, self-harm, the impact of a competitive society, the impact on people's lives, the alienation and so on, has a direct, direct, direct impulse, impact. These figures I just read out as well, I think we understand is when Thatcher got elected in 1979, a symbol of a victory of, uh, against the so-called so Second World, World War consensus, the reform, the end of that potential part of trying to uh, stabilise the system, ushered in a whole attack on, on, on young people and resulted in the figures in which I have just, uh, just, 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 just dis dis described. So, when we ask ourselves, young people revolution, why? Well, that is the material conditions of young people's lives. It's getting worse, not better. A system cannot deliver the basics for young people. The conclusion? Well, you heard the conclusion of what we have to do. You see it in Spain, you see it in, in Egypt, and so on. The question of revolution is not a necessity, it's not a, it's, it's, sorry, it's not a luxury anymore. If you're going to seriously talk about putting an end to this abuse, if we're seriously going to talk about putting an end to all what is rotten in our society, in our lives, the question of revolution is not an abstract thing. It's an actuality of it. When we look to the struggles, Last this week, the pension struggles. It is about the young and the future and the uniting of the young and the old together on the streets of London. That's the hope we bring, I think, in the last number of weeks. But if we're really going to do it, we want to win those reforms. We need to be the defenders of what was always good from the 1945 Labour government which ushered in all, the, all, the, all, those, all those changes. But we have to remember the governments and the political parties that, 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 that said that they were the carriers of that tradition have long, long ago left that tradition behind and do not believe they can defend it. It is only us, those on the streets, those in the workplace, and the political tradition of a view and a vision of a society based upon not only people's needs, but one which allows the creativity and the dynamism which we saw at Millbank and other places, which we see in, in, in Madrid and we saw in Tunisia and we see in, 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 in Tears Square. That creativity can be unleashed. God knows what we could do. That's our project.